Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this time of worship today. To be in your house on a beautiful day where we are reminded of your artistry and your handiwork. A day where we can all come to your table of grace to be forgiven. That no matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter what we've done or left undone, no matter what regrets or shame we carry, through your grace and your Son, you receive us. And we praise you for that today even as we open your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this weekend I went away with some of our college students to Camp Simatonga. Oh, let me invite the children to come out to meet Miss Laura. Oops. Children, it's time for Children's Church. Come on down and meet Miss Laura for Children's Church. This weekend I went away with some of our college students. Are there any of those college students here? I see you. There you are. We went to Camp Simatonga to do some mission work in preparation for our Nicaragua mission trip. And some of our college students have committed themselves to being missionaries in the name of Christ to Nicaragua this summer in August. And I just want to say on their behalf that they have taken this amazingly serious. They've planned the videos that you've seen that have promoted uh, the Nicaragua fundraiser that we've been doing. They've got other fundraisers planned. They've They've made the arrangements for the trip. They set up this weekend and just, just great leadership. I mean, I've been just amazed. It's been wonderful. So I went away to, with them to Camp Simatonga overnight and all day yesterday we picked up sticks from a tornado that they had and moved limbs, trailer loads of, of wood and limbs trying to help out and clean up for the camps that go on there in the spring and summer. And I got home last night late, like 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Uh, and when I got home, the boys were already asleep. Wade and Haynes were upstairs asleep. And so I went up there to, to check on them, and I walked in their rooms, and I had this kind of experience that parents have from time to time, a kind of an epiphany-type experience, kind of one of those light bulb moments where you look at your child there asleep, and it's like you're seeing them for the first time. And it wasn't that I'd been away for a long time on a trip. I'd just been gone for one night. But, but when I looked at my kids, I just felt this emotion kind of welling up inside me. And I was just thinking, what an amazing gift of God. And I, I just kind of knelt down by the bed and listened to them breathe and kind of felt their cheeks, their faces were warm. And I just thought, God, you're so awesome. You're so amazing. How could I ever deserve this? How could I ever be given a gift like this? And I felt the tears come in my eyes. And I walked back downstairs and Julia was working on her Sunday school lesson. And then I just said, thank you, thank you for the gift of my sons. And it, it was as if my eyes had been opened. And sometimes our eyes need to be opened. Sometimes our eyes need to be reopened. And it's amazing how God gives us at times these epiphany moments where we see things that have been there all along or, or we recognize things for what they really are. And it's as if we're being woken up from a dream where we don't recognize the goodness around us or we don't see reality such as it truly is. People who've battled addiction, if you know someone or if you yourself have battled addiction to drugs or alcohol or anything, oftentimes people in recovery will talk about having a moment of clarity where sometimes for no reason, sometimes because someone says something or the certain circumstances are right or, or because they've hit bottom or hit an even deeper bottom or, 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 or another bottom after that, will report having had a moment of clarity where all of a sudden they saw their life clearly and said, what am I doing? I mean, they were doing the same thing the day before, but something just happened, and they, they see their lives clear and say, what am I doing? Why am I throwing my life away? I it doesn't have to be this way. And you can spin your wheels forever trying to make someone have that moment of clarity. Trust me, I know. But it's just a mystical thing that happens that cannot be engineered by human hands. It's a movement of the Spirit, I believe, that wakes us up or that turns the light bulb on. And maybe you've had those experiences in your life where suddenly you realize something about someone or, or suddenly you see the, 
the blessings that someone has been in your life or suddenly you see what someone has overcome and you just never really stop to think about it and it just changes reality for you. It's like you're seeing for the very first time. Well, our gospel lesson this morning is just like that. One of the most beautiful and mystical stories in the Bible and it follows the resurrection of Jesus. Hear these words from Luke chapter 24. An eye-opening experience, you might say, an, an epiphany that changed, changed reality forever for certain people. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. These were disciples, not the twelve, but the kind of outer ring of disciples, probably a group of some 80, 90 people who were very committed to Christ, but they weren't necessarily in that inner, inner circle. So they're talking about what just happened, and their hearts are, are heavy. Their spirits are broken. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing them. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Now here's how I envision this. They're walking down the road thoroughly engrossed in their conversation. They're emotional. They may be crying. They're, they're despondent. They're trying to make sense of what has happened. And all of a sudden they hear this voice behind them, so of course they stop. And their thought is, where did, where did this guy come from? How long has he been there? Has he been listening to us all along? They didn't hear him come up. And so they stop and they turn around and their faces tell the whole story. And their countenance is dark. Maybe there's tears in their eyes, but they certainly look sad. He said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, spoke up and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Like, where, what rock have you been living under? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. Aha, there's a clue there. A prophet? So you see, even among the disciples of Jesus, this wasn't just a couple of people who'd heard about what happened. These were people involved in the movement. These were people who had followed Jesus, people who had seen the miracles, people who had heard his teaching, and even they still didn't get it, and they call him a prophet. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. They don't say Savior, they don't say Son of God, Son of Man, Lord, Prophet. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, which means they're disappointed. We had hoped, before these things, before we were disappointed, before we were let down, before it didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, before what we wanted to happen didn't happen, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Notice again, they didn't say we saw, they saw angels or that there were angels at the tomb, that there were real angels there. <clears throat> Rather, they say they saw a vision of angels. It's like they, they think they saw them. They saw them in their mind. They had a, a spiritual experience, but not a reality experience of there being an angel. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. And I love that part of the story that they're in confusion and they're despondent and they feel probably alone and isolated. 
in many ways. But it's Jesus who opens the word of God to them. They have seen it, read it, heard it, but they didn't understand it. They could not perceive the truth within it. It took Christ, it took the risen Lord and the Spirit of God in him to interpret Scripture to them in such a way that they could understand. It took him explaining it. Now, just recently, someone asked me, how is it that in one church they say this, in one church they say that? Or in one church they say you can do this, but in another church they say you can't do that. Or they emphasize this scripture here, but not that scripture there. How, you know, how do you know what to believe? How do you know who to listen to? And my answer to that oddly foreshadowed today's message. Who is the one who interprets scripture to us but Christ? Christ is the legend to the map. Christ is the Rosetta Stone we use to translate God's Word. Christ is the lens through which we see and read Scripture. Does it conform to what He said? Does what He said amplify it? How do His words, how does His life and teaching make us understand this? He's the interpretive lens that we use to make sense of all of Scripture. We compare it to what He said. We compare it to what He did. He is ultimately the Word of God. As John says in chapter 1. So Jesus does that very thing for them. He, he himself enlightens them. And that's why it's so important to pray before you read the Bible. I would recommend to you never read it. Until you pray first and ask for Jesus to interpret it for you. For the Spirit to open it to you. To speak to you through it as happens here. But then the story gets even better. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. Now, this was only a seven-mile trip, so they must have gotten a late start in the day because it's getting dark. And the two journeyers, the two travelers, are going to stop overnight for supper and overnight. And Jesus starts to go on ahead of them. But what did they do? Which is kind of odd for someone to do with a stranger. As, he came near, as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, not in a perfunctory way, but strongly, they urged him saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Did he invite himself in? No. Did he barge down the door? Did he force his way in? Did I mute this? No. Did he force his way in? No. They invited him in. And spiritually, there's a real truth in that. Oftentimes, even when we don't see it, I believe always, Jesus is with us. And we don't see it because we're so wrapped up in what's going on. In hard times, we're struggling, trying to figure it out in our minds, trying to figure it out with other people. And so wrapped up in what we're doing or, or the way we're coping, we don't even see Jesus with us. We don't even recognize him with us. And then he doesn't force himself into our lives, but he allows us to invite him in. I mean, there's a spiritual lesson in this about the way God works in our lives, that he waits on us to invite him in. He will not force his way into our lives. We have to invite him in. And so these travelers did just that. Stay with us because it's almost evening and the, the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, very similar to the table we'll gather at today, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. And then these words that I love so much, they turned to each other and said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Now, I don't think they're talking about reflux disease here, people. Like they forgot to take their medicine. I think he's talking about a spiritual burning in their hearts. And they're now 
having had their eyes open, they're reflecting back and all of a sudden it makes sense that while this person was talking to them, they had felt something. They felt a burning inside. They felt something happening, but they couldn't put a word to it. They couldn't put a name to it. But once he had opened their eyes, they were able to look back and see that he had been there with them all along. But they had been so self-involved and so wrapped up in what they were feeling that they didn't recognize the very person they were talking about was right there with them. But when they invited him in, not just invited him in, but invited him into an intimate place. Because in Jewish custom, to invite a stranger to a meal was very, very strange. I mean, it's a very intimate thing to break bread together. But they invited him in. And as they broke the bread together, their eyes were opened. They saw Christ. And they saw each other. And they saw what? They saw that they hadn't been alone all that time. And they saw that there was no reason to despair, but that Jesus truly lived. And they were given inspiration, and they were given comfort. And not only that, they were given enlightenment, because then they realized that the person who had been explaining it all to them the whole time had been Christ. That he had been there all along. There's some amazing things about this story. First of which is that they weren't alone when this happened. But it was two believers together. Now I think that's instructive. I think that's why elsewhere in scripture it says where two or more are gathered in my name. And certainly they were because they were talking about what had happened. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am as well, the Bible tells us. And and in this, two or more were gathered. And not just gathered, but they were on a journey. Isn't that a rich metaphor? They were on a journey from despair. And where did they end up? in hope. They were on a journey from the cross where their spirits had been broken to a place of breaking bread together with Jesus and having their eyes opened to what it had all been about all along. But it happened in community, not in isolation. This is a picture of the church that God built on Peter and that Jesus came to establish that our faith journey is together in community, that we have and are called to a life together in faith, that their faith, the resurrection of Jesus, was revealed to them in community, not in anonymity. And I think that we as believers have made a mess of that recently. Something about our spirits is attracted to anonymity. And I'm still trying to figure this out as a pastor. Because we want friendships and we want relationships, but at the same time, you know, we're scared to take that step. We're attracted and we're repelled from it. But in this picture, we see Jesus revealed as the believers gathered together and broke the bread. And that's why we pattern our church on that here. And that's why our our discipleship model here is worship and grow, be in a small group. This this isn't a do-it-yourself, I I show up to get mine and go home kind of experience Christianity. That's not it. It's not a box we check off. Okay, did that. No, it's, it's relational that we journey together from the place that we were to the place where God wants us to be. To the play, from the place where our eyes are closed and we don't understand, isn't that the story? To a place where our eyes are opened by Christ and we get it. And we do that together. And the culmination of that is, is in us breaking bread and, and the intimate sharing in table fellowship. There's a picture of how God wills discipleship to be. Hear that. I believe that this is a picture of how God wills discipleship to be. And to reject it is to reject His plan and to reject Him. 
Thanks be to God, these disciples didn't do that. They, they invited him in to their fellowship, to their community. And because they did that, they saw the face of God. I've seen the face of God more in my life in the believers that I've known than anywhere else. As a pastor, sometimes I think it's not fair that I get to see it as much as I do. I think sometimes, why is it wasted on me? And then I think, well, maybe God knows I need it more than most people. But one of the most amazing things about being a pastor is to get to see Christ in people all the time. Just wherever I look, in the most unlikely places, seeing you doing things you would never do were it not for Jesus at work in your life. And I think, God, it's not fair. Everybody should get to see this. And the good news is, you can. When you engage in community with other believers. I even asked Lana today to put those brochures out on the chairs about the journey. Because our faith together is a journey. And there's three parts of that journey. And I want you to think about today... What part of that journey is missing for you? The journey of worship, which we do here today. The journey of serving others. But perhaps this morning, most importantly, as a response to God's Word, the journey of community, of being in the Word together, of breaking bread, of being in a small group where we share together in this journey in Christ. And I think sometimes that scares us because if someone really knows me, will they like me? Will they accept me? Are we going to have to get ooey-gooey and touchy-feely? I don't have enough time like everybody else. Everybody else has more time than me. I'm busier than everybody. Whatever these things in our minds. I don't need it. Other people need it, but I don't need it. I'm good. I got mine. What is it? that keeps us from experiencing what they experienced in this story. We are in the Easter season. Easter is about new beginnings. Jesus' resurrection was a new beginning for the world. I pray that this would be a new beginning for you. And you would say, I'm ready to be on the journey, not alone, but with my brothers and sisters in Christ. From where I was to where God would have me be. To see his face. And I invite you to that journey today. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you this day for this gift of a journey in faith. That we're not in it alone. That you never intended us to be in it alone. That your last words in Matthew were, Lo, I am with you, with you, with you always, even until the end of the age. And that it's in community that we see that most of all. Lord, please don't let us be a church that does anonymous. But let us be a church, God, that's faithful to Scripture that embraces community, a church that's a family, a family joined together through your grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.